you will, we're going to read Luke 2. We're going to read a section of verses through there regarding Christ's birth. Uh, if you have a phone, you can pull it out. I'm sure if you have a Bible tonight, you might not be able to see. Um, or you can just listen to me and take, take my word for it. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house of the lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom He is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning the child. And all who heard it wondered of, at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, as it had been told them. And at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given him by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Some things I want to just kind of talk about tonight briefly in, in this devotion is just observations of the birth that as I was preparing and reading through that I hadn't really noticed before and had caught my eye. The story of Jesus' birth is really quite remarkable when you think about it. The God of the universe, the creator of all things, was born in human flesh, fully God, fully man. The world in which He created so graciously welcomed Him in a manger. The place He created provided for Him a manger as his first resting spot on this earth. Not only that, but the welcoming party sent to receive him were shepherds. In that day, some of the poorest and least thought of among men. Those were the ones which were sent to welcome the Savior of the world here. If all this isn't enough, the king issues a decree requiring the death of all the firstborn up to age two. Later in Jesus' life, we see the world treating him no differently than how they first received him. You see, the inn didn't have room for him. He was born unassumingly in the middle of the night. He was welcomed by lowly shepherds. He was sent to hide in order that he might not be killed due to the decree of the king. You know, reading through the scriptures of Luke 2, thinking about Christ being born in a manger, you think about the creator of all things, the king of kings, the lord of lords, coming to his earth and being born in a manger, having no place for himself. I couldn't help but think about Matthew 8 when the scribe came up to Jesus saying, He will follow him wherever he goes. And Jesus replies, With the foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. You know, I can't help but to wonder if maybe his birth was on his mind, that even from the beginning of time there was no place for him to lay his head other than a manger. You know, this was a fair warning to the scribe and a warning and a reminder to us as followers of what to expect from the world. They received the King of kings and the Lord of lords into the world without a bat of an eye. But you see, not much has changed since the, for since the birth of Christ. The majority of the world didn't recognize what was among them then, and the majority of the world still doesn't recognize who is among them now. And the contrast I saw was the one that you have a set of people who, you know, the king's more concerned with his power and his legacy and his might than he is with the prophecy of these wise men that come to him. You see the innkeeper having no idea. Mary and Joseph, they were revealed to them, obviously, that 
um, something miraculous was occurred. The, the ones that whom it had been revealed were Mary and Joseph, who knew something special was going on because she was miraculously pregnant by the Holy Spirit of God. You see, Joseph found the warning and declaration of God worthy for sticking around for. Imagine being the shepherds in the field, okay? Get this, right? Imagine being the shepherds in the field, watching your sheep on an unassuming night, and all of a sudden an angel appears to them. Their immediate reaction is to tremble with fear as this angel in all of his angelic light shines around them. But once the angel calms their fears and proclaims the good news he was sent to deliver, a chorus of all choruses breaks out as it says a multitude of heavenly hosts appeared praising God. Imagine that scene, calm unassuming night interrupted by the angelic being delivering news of the Savior of the world, suddenly joined in by a chorus of heavenly host, probably sounding pretty similar to what you just heard earlier. Maybe a little better, right? <laughs> but it was not just an ordinary night. The ones to whom it was revealed knew that something amazing had happened, especially these wise men, especially these shepherds, and they wanted to go see what was brought into the world. You see, with Christ... At the time, there were many who didn't realize, didn't bat an eye that He was born. And then there were some that knew that something was going on, but didn't quite realize what this miraculous work was that had done in the birth of Christ. They would see it. They would grasp it towards the end of His life and in the resurrection. But at the time, they didn't know. But looking back, receiving Christ as our Lord and Savior, the reason we're here tonight to celebrate, we can see a few of the things that was brought into the world that night. Much more than the world could ever imagine happened on this unassuming night. Christ entered the world, fully man, fully God. With Christ entering the world that night also was the magnificent gift of God's love. Until this point, true love had never been known. Even still, in this moment, true love wouldn't be grasped, but only after the act in which Christ so selflessly, selflessly gave of Himself in order to save those who hated Him. The world, with its cold welcome, didn't stop the welcoming party there. It continued its disdain for the Son of God due to the hardness of their hearts by continuing to reject Him to the point of nailing Him to a tree. But even to a world full of sinners, God sent the special gift of His Son to it. And He sent His love through His Son into the world for the first time. 1 John 3, 1 says, See with what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Romans 5, 7, and 8 also says, For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one dare even to die. But God shows His love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That night we received so much more than a baby being born in a manger. We received a godly love that had never before been seen. We received a godly love that would lead us to Him and would empower us to live with that love throughout our lives. God commands us to love one another, but left to ourselves, we're incapable of this command. But God does not leave us short in what He requires, but He fulfills His request to love through sending His Son in order to show us what true love is. Not only that, as we submit to that love, as our hearts are filled with that love through the Holy Spirit of God, we are enabled to love in a way we were previously incapable of. God provides what He requires. He requires love, so He gives it through Christ. And that love so permeates to our soul that it overflows in our life and to the world around us and gives great glory to God and good for His people. This is just one of the gifts God so graciously granted us on the night of the birth of His Son true love. Not only did God shower us with the gift of love on the night Christ entered the world, but He also granted us life. Until the point of the birth of Christ, there was no hope of overcoming the devil's most powerful curse through sin, death. With the birth of Christ, we finally have a means by which to escape the curse of death by Christ becoming a curse for us and dying once and for all to set the captives free by overcoming death through His death. In Him we have a hope of life everlasting in His presence. 
In order to gain life, we must lose ours. Just as Christ's death brought life, we must also die to ourselves and to the world in order to gain true life. Like the world had never known possible, life like the world had never known possible was brought into the world the night Christ was born. The gift of life had been given to us through the sacrifice and resurrection of Christ. We are now enabled in our life to look to the true life that is to come. We are unable to hold loosely the things in this world while we pour, point our minds to the world we will never lose hold of. We no longer look outward in despair and desperation, but upward in our hope and joy to live eternally in the presence of our Most High King, Jesus Christ. The night God brought His Son into the world, He brought the means by which he will, we will experience true life. John 1 verses 4 through 5 says, In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. John 1, 9 through 13 continues, The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through Him, yet the world did not know Him. He came to His own, and His own people did not receive Him. But to all who did receive Him, who believed in His name, He gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of their flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. You see, we're called to live as lights in a dark world. And this is enabled by the two gifts, at least two gifts, brought into the world the night Christ was born. We were given the gift of true love, and we were given the gift of eternal life. Both of these characteristics have been given to us through Jesus Christ, and they are transformative. So much so that a dead body now breathes. The dry bones of my soul are now a living body that will never fail nor perish. The true light of the world came into the world and enabled us to love and have true life, which in turn projects that true light through us in this dark world around us. You see, when you encounter Jesus, the true Jesus, He changes you. God molds you into the image of Him, and the true light shines through you to illuminate the helpless and give life to the hopeless. We are lights in this dark world because He is the light that shines through us. So at this time, we're going to do our candle lighting ceremony. And hopefully this will light. Okay. All right. Give me one second here. Okay, so we'll go to backup plan, okay? Yes. So the true light, which this is obviously not, this is a fake light. <laughs> The true light had come into the world, which looks more like this. <laughs> and so we each have a light in our hand. It's a light that's not lit. And each of you have one. If you don't have one, if you raise your hand, we'll get you one real quick. Um, but I want you to notice tonight the dark, dim, lifeless candle in your hands and how it projects to those around you is it projects further darkness. It's because it's the same as the other dim candles around you. But what we're about to do physically, I want you to see, has happened to you spiritually. This is going to be a tangible exercise of what happens when your cold, dead, lifeless heart comes into contact with the true light. It illuminates. As you hold your candle, think about the love and the life that was brought into the world through the birth, life, and death of Jesus Christ. And let us be thankful and give great glory to God. So what I want to do, we're going to make it awkward. I want one by one, except for Maddie. Somebody can light hers for her. Come up and light your candle and go back and stand and we'll hold it together and as you light this candle let it remind you of your cold heart that's been brought to life through the true light which is Jesus Christ and the effect that it has on you as it shines his true light through you and so if you will just stand up and we can go row by row and go back to your seat once you've got it and hold your candle and Grant and Angela will play us a little background music and we'll get into our final song Go ahead. 